Hey guys, it's Ask Sebi. Today we're going to do a roundup of a bunch of different topics related to Chase. Big favor before we dive into all of this, give it a thumbs up, that way other people can find it. The first topic is going to be that Chase Pay is shutting down. If this sounds familiar, it's because back in 2020, they actually announced that they were shutting down the mobile app. So if we go to their archive is, we can see that they were focusing on their online merchants. So they were looking to add Grubhub as well as 60,000 others basically giving up on their mobile app and focusing on online. If you go to that page now as of 2021, you can see that they're looking to wind things down by March 31st, 2021. They're going to be removing Chase Pay across their merchant apps, including Shell, Starbucks, and Walmart Online. They're also doing the same thing for PayPal and advising you to add other cards. Overall, I'm not that surprised because it's something that didn't really do anything. It didn't make the experience better. I think a lot of big brands are going to start realizing that you can't just do exactly the same thing. It either needs to be better, maybe different, or at least have some other incentive structure. The absolute best case is that they decide to relaunch this in a different form, maybe call it Chase Sapphire Pay, and then have some other incentive for us to sign up. So maybe something like $20 for using the app. And on that funny note, there is a Chase United card that's being relaunched later on this month. Main takeaway is to grab the bonuses, grab the incentives as they're on the table because you never know when they're going to disappear. As a consumer, the really good thing is that you can technically grab as many of these as you want and then decide whether you want to keep it afterwards. If you're looking to add some equity positions, add some stocks that might be on sale right now, then I'd look into Webull, two free stocks for signing up and depositing $100. Pretty good alternative to Robinhood and it's definitely worth taking a look. I'll leave a link down below. Next is going to be a bunch of Chase offers. I feel like they're not as exciting as I would like because they seem pretty standard, but I think it's still worth mentioning. The first one is the Southwest cards and the increased offer ends on March 10th. If you're watching this after March 10th, then use the chapters tool to skip to the next part. The minimum spend is $5,000 in the first three months. And for that, you're going to get 30,000 Southwest points and also Southwest companion pass. The 30,000 points are nice, but they're kind of just a little add-on, kind of a sweetener for this. So 30,000 points times 1.5 cents per point, that's about $450 in value. You get Southwest Companion Pass for about a year or so until February 28th of 2022. The reason Southwest Companion Pass is interesting is because every time you fly, someone else can fly off you for free. So whether you use points, cash, or credit card, I can fly for free. The annual fee for these vary, but if you're considering this, I'd probably go with the priority. I think it has the best value in the long term, so it's the most keeper of the bunch due to the fact that you're getting more credits and or points for that annual fee. This one is a pretty big toss up though, depending on if you're looking to travel this summer, but I think a lot of people are, and also whether you want to travel domestically. Next is going to be the IHG Premier, where you're going to get 140,000 points for $3,000 of minimum spend in the first three months. We've seen this offer before, that's why it's not that interesting, but I think the fact that people are doing road trips or looking to travel, there's a lot of pent up travel demand, makes it interesting. My floor value for IHG points is 0.6 cents per point, so if I'm not getting at least that amount, then I'm probably either going to pay off my credit card or look at a different hotel program that might have more advantageous rates. Oftentimes, if there's an IHG property, there's going to be a Marriott, there's also going to be a Hyatt. That's actually why you want to have a lot of different currencies so you're not stuck with one. 140 times 0.6 cents per point is going to be $840 in value. So pretty good value given the minimum spend and the annual fee there. There is an $89 annual fee, but I think it's pretty reasonable because for every year after the first one that you're paying that annual fee, you're going to be getting an anniversary night that you can use that generally covers that fee. For most people, you're probably going to be able to use it for at least a road trip somewhere. So maybe you're going away for a long weekend. Ceiling value was probably one cents per point, so about $1,400 in value, but that is specifically towards Maldives, Bora Bora, and those type of locations rather than domestic. The last one is United, where you have a 65,000 point offer, but it is tranched into two different levels. The first one is 40,000 points after $2,000 of minimum spend in the first three months. If you value the points aggressively, 40,000 points, 1.5 cents per point, that's going to be $600. 600 for 2,000 minimum spend is 30% back, which is pretty competitive. The floor is going to be about one cents per point, so $400 in value, divided by a $2,000 MSR, that's a 20% return on spend. So by itself, that's pretty good, but I feel like the second tranche might not make sense for a lot of people. The second part is going to be 25,000 points for an additional 8,000 spent, so 10,000 in total. And that second part is within the first six months. Taking the same floor and target that we had from before, you're looking at about $250 in value, to about 375. So on the low end, about 3% return on spend for the bonus portion, not counting the points that you normally get from the card. 
On the high end, about 4.7 cents per point, which isn't bad at all, but it's not really as juicy as other bonuses. I think it's fine if you're someone who has a lot of spend, if you're renovating, if you have a big tax payment, but for other people, it might not make sense. I'd probably wait for one that's not tranched or has something that's a bit more reasonable. On that note, if you want to learn about any of these, we have links on our website, AskSebi.com, and also down below in the description box. I think for most people, I'd recommend finishing off Chase, getting the ones that make sense, and then moving into other issuers. A lot of these cards can either be downgraded to no annual fee cards, or they end up being keeper cards due to their benefits and their other certificates and points and stuff like that. The last thing we're going to look at is some fraud involving Chase, but we don't really know who's at fault. It might not even be Chase. That might just be the vehicle for the fraud. Pittsburgh area residents still receiving Chase bank cards that they did not sign up for. There's over 25 different cases and they ended up creating a task force. So is this Chase's fault or is there something else going on? I'm leaning towards something else going on because it doesn't seem like a nationwide thing. My guess is that someone in that area ended up buying one of the lists online that have all your socials and stuff. So basically if you go to the dark web, they do sell stuff like this and they're just applying for cards. Police said personal information is being used to create accounts because of a recent Chase Bank offer. Chase offers $200 if you open a new checking account with them and set up a direct deposit. It sounds like someone bought information online, realized that they could only do it once for themselves, and then decided to set up other accounts for other people. It better not be one of you guys. Mandy actually went through something like this in the past where someone in her building bought a lot of these lists with a lot of information online. And the way we knew this was because we ended up looking at the apartment's trash and finding her stuff. So yes, I was digging in the trash to solve crime. So imagine if the stack was all paper and someone printed it out and it was just lines and lines of names, socials, and addresses. Some of them were circled, checked, or crossed off, so there was obviously a system there. Mandy ended up bringing that to the police office and I don't think they did anything. The main takeaway from that story is to lock your credit reports when you're not using them, to expect stuff like this, which really sucks to say, and to check your mail because that's a surprisingly big one if you live in either a big building or in a place where people can steal your stuff. The reason I say the last one is because I've had some relatives who are very anti-technology who've had their identity stolen, and the worst part of it is that they don't even realize it's happening. They do their banking in branch and they don't do any online transactions. The fact that that's the case means that they don't catch things as fast. My question for you guys is what are your thoughts on Chase Pay going away? Have you used it before? What was your experience? How did it compare to anything else? What about the Chase offers? Which one is the most interesting for you? And with the fraud case with Chase, do you think that's something nationwide? Do you think it's a rogue agent in a specific branch? Or do you think it's hackers who pretty much stole this database? Let me know and everyone else know in the comments down below. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. It really helps us out. If you know anyone else who benefit, share this with them. I'll probably help them out. But otherwise, hope you guys liked it. See you guys next time.